This is the prohibition from the Torah of Wo Tasig Reacha. Do not move back the boundaries of your friend, which the early ones had marked out. So the simplest way to understand this is you have a boundary marker with your friend, with your neighbor, and you just move the boundary marker. I'll wait a minute, Shoshana, I'll wait. 1056. Yep. It's not all bad. You had someone put that. Welcome. Yeah, somebody was. Yeah. No. You got it? So basically. You Yesterday you gave the example of a pizza shop, but we never read the Rashi. Yeah, we didn't read the Rashi, but. But the, technically speaking, what, what this is referring to is if you move the boundaries of your friend's land, that way you steal their land. As, what? That's what it means. Yeah. In the land that you inherit, she says, to move the boundary backwards. That you relocate the boundary marker backwards into your friend's field to expand your own field. So that's a simple explanation. But Rashi says, But doesn't it already say, Do not rob. So why does it say, Do not move back? Meaning to say, we already have a separate prohibition of, against stealing. Why do we need a specific example of moving the boundary marker? Isn't that just another form of stealing? People were doing it. Yeah, but isn't that just another form of stealing? It is, but people were doing it anyway. So that's, so that's to single it out. Well, let's see what. Uh, so uh, she says, we made our, Steve's, I'm sure, correct, but he says, we made our son. Limod it's teaching us that about somebody who uproots his friend's boundary, over He's not going to just be in violation of one prohibition, stick him with another prohibition, hit him with another felony. I might think, even outside the land of Israel, Tamil Omar, and where is this a specific prohibition? Teaching us, so in the land of Israel, you're going to be in violation of two prohibitions for moving the boundary marker, but outside, you're only in violation of one prohibition. Outside of Israel, you're only in violation of the prohibition of do not steal. And then I said yesterday when we cut off that this is cited by the Talmud to say that if your friend sets down uh, like traps to bring the fish there, let's say you put down bait, then you shouldn't go next to their bait that they already laid down and then catch the fish. So that's the concept. That's the concept that you can't benefit from what somebody else has done and then just piggyback off of it without doing something. Well, you know, the thing that comes to mind is that famous local area kosher establishments yeah. that we've had. And that's the other side of it is when is competition allowed? And, you know, at, these people have laid the groundwork for this to be a kosher area. You know, right. different things, they offer different products, but at one point there were two butchers right next to each other. In D.C.? No, in... In Maryland, yeah, in yeah. Maryland. And of course, so the point is that that's a... Uh, certainly a concept that uh, is selectively enforced in uh, the kashrut agency saying, oh, we can't give you a kosher supervision because you're right next to another place we certify. And if we have two pizza stores, neither one will survive. They're both quite a business. This guy was attracting the people first and now you're gonna take away his livelihood. Mm -hmm. So that always gets everybody upset because everybody else is sick of the first guy's pizza because they've been eating it for 15 years. And they want a new flavor. So it gets everybody worked up and people get worked up. And then they say, oh, this rabbi is related to the guy who owns a pizza store. That's why he doesn't mind. It's this 
brother-in-law and it gets all dirty and it sounds like something you don't want. I'm just saying that this is the classic case. It happens in a lot of communities and it's it's really hard to justify because I, I've never seen like when two stores open up that all of a sudden they take away business from the first store. Really what happens when two stores open up is there's just plenty to go around and it makes build a stronger community. Like more people go, everybody gets excited about it. So is I'm, this the source for this? Yeah, this is, the, this is the source for it. I, I've never been sympathetic to the idea that you can't open up another establishment because it will drive away the business from the first guy and the first guy will go out of business. Well, first of all, the first guy shouldn't go out of business if he does a better job. Let him just do a better job, make better pizza, and then everybody will want to go. And uh, you can't like force people to just buy from one store. It's in today's world, there's everybody's traveling. It's not like we're in a shuttle where nobody else comes in, you know, especially in a city like Washington or New York, where you have so many people ordering. So I'm not sympathetic to that argument, but, but uh, that's, this is the source for it. I'm not sympathetic that it applies to the restaurants is my point. Yes, Mr. Shackman. Uh, your uh, argument uh, against this, uh, because in big cities, uh, there are, there's a lot of Jews and they we could support both stories. But go to a little town somewhere where there's just a handful of Jews and they're interested in uh, kosher food. And there's one Jewish a butcher or a grocery store there in that case uh what the torah is saying uh applies uh, you'll drive uh, both of them will go down the the bathtub uh, uh drain uh if both of them open up in a small jewish community in a small town yeah i don't think that there are small jewish communities today that have butchers it just doesn't exist like all all the butchers today Possibly. Yeah, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? It just seems to me that then you're consigning your small community to the lesser of the guys. The guy makes bad pizza, but he was there first. And right. you won't let the better guy open up. You're just saying to the people, no choice for you. For sure, it's difficult. And also today, I remember when, um, here's Jerry, you know, I, I this stuck with me. me I'm so, I hope I don't offend anyone. But I remember when... Uh, Bill Clinton was running for office. I think he did NAFTA. I think he did NAFTA. And he was in, he was in a, like a town hall meeting in Michigan. And the guy says, you know, uh, he said, well, now I have to compete. I don't, I'm, I might be a little bit wrong about the example, but he said, now I have to compete against all these people. They're bringing in the, uh, into my area, into my town. And I, how can I compete against their prices? And his answer was, well, now you use the technology. Don't just be delivering to the people who are across the street from you. You ship all over the world. That's what this technology is enabling to do. You could ship to everyone. So the point is, I would suggest to that pizza store or to that butcher shop that today's economy and today's marketplace is, is so much broader than one small neighborhood, that we have shipping abilities. We have abilities through the internet. A lot of times, like I sometimes get meat delivered from Brooklyn, frozen meat. So where's the Hasaga school there? You could be all over the world and you could access, you could get next day delivery from Brooklyn. So even if you're in, let's say a town like, uh, you know, um, I don't know, a small town anymore that has their own butcher shop. I don't even think they do for this reason. But let's say you're in a small Midwestern town and they, I'm sorry, what were you gonna say Rabbi Yosef? Fredericton, but- do they, have, do they have a butcher? Have we haven't there? for about 35 years now. So. Right. And you don't have any butchers. So the small towns just don't have it anymore. And, 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 but it especially shouldn't apply. And I heard of a recent case where it applied in the five towns. They said, I saw the school, they wouldn't let another supermarket open. I mean, I'm thinking like, there's 100,000 Jews there. It does not make any sense to me. Yes, Jerry, I'm sorry. Well, uh, 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 let's, let's delete the word butcher shop. I'm talking about a, a, a grocery store that has kosher items for this small Jewish community somewhere in Podunk, Missouri. Um, Again, opening, I don't... Second, opening up a second Jewish uh, grocery store will be the demise of both of them. 
So I think that that ship has sailed because my opinion is that all the grocery stores today are all over the country, meaning to say you can get from online kosher to your door the next day. And all the small Jewish towns don't really have kosher grocery stores. What? It's not Jewish only. Small grocery stores. Yeah. Yeah, everything is Walmart or whatever. So I guess the question is this. I'm not saying that I disagree with you. And I think competition breeds a bigger community and a, the bigger it shows how strong the community can be. That being said, when do you think that this pasuk is applicable then? When in today's, is there any scenario in today's time where you could be taking somebody's bread in a way that's applicable? Like where does this apply? So, so I want to say another thing about that. Like, I don't know that it applies today. There, you know, in, historically it was also applied, like if there was one rabbi in town, another rabbi couldn't open up a shul. But that too also, like today, you have all the teachings on the internet. You know, you're not just, you're not, you can, a lot of people do online Jewish education. I would say Chabad actually sticks to it with their territories and they say that you can't take another man's bread. Except for the fact that Chabad will come in to every Jewish community in the uh, world. Uh, no, seriously. It only and, works among Chabad. Right, right. They, they, right. Among Chabad, they won't let their among own Chabad, Chabad. They won't let their own Chabad, but they won't apply it to, uh, like, you or anybody else. Yeah, and, and, and I don't I think they should apply it. I think that everybody should open up wherever they want. They should be, there's not enough people to serve the uh, Jewish community. I don't get offended if they open up, but I'm just saying that, that, the whole, I don't understand how it could work in today's world. The only way I could think it could work is if like you specifically are stealing the uh, protected intellectual property that this person has done to uh, to achieve something and then you just come in and piggyback off that in violation of let's say American law. Then I could see it perhaps, but I'm not, I'm saying today's economy is very different than, than the economy of 2000 years ago. So we'd have to be, and, and by the way, there's another factor here if you're saying the whole purpose is to protect the consumer so that he does not have any stores, by not allowing another store to open, you're definitely hurting the consumer and you're making the prices higher. More competition drives down prices. Yeah, and but, I don't, but essentially, if somebody creates a thing and then you, like you said, it gets copied at a reduced price, somebody's copying essentially except for one minor thing that's changing. How is that not taking somebody's so, man's initial bread? If that's right. If it's if but it's, it is, that if it's true. on every product, somebody makes a less quality, almost replica version of it at a reduced price. So on one hand, you're saying the competition is good and it's going to drive prices down, but essentially they're taking someone's idea and stealing it. But if that's a copyright violation, then you have the Murphy Law. Right. Yeah. So and it's different if you just say, I'm opening a grocery store and he's yeah. already going to get a grocery store. But if I steal your Stereo speaker technology, and I stole it. China did not stole it. China we have to rely it. upon Amer a, a lot on American law here. But yeah, let's see. Jerry has a follow-up question. Uh, yeah. Doesn't doesn't the Shulchan Aruch uh, specify that the competition cannot be in the same block? But if it's two or three blocks away, it's okay. Correct? Yeah. So so the question is like two or three blocks. What does that even mean today? Um, when you can get in your car and be, you know, like the distance to take you from Shalom's in Silver Spring to Seven Mile Market uh, is 40 minutes. So, uh, you know, there's... I, I grew up in Parkside, part of Camden, New Jersey. Oh, yeah? Uh, there were... No wonder you're so tough. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there were three or four kosher butchers and were kosher. Yeah. Different kosher uh, general stores, I guess. You yeah. Community stores. I mean, no one worried about it. Well, there, back then, the kosher butchers, they weren't certified by like, a large organization. The guy was Jewish and he said, I'm kosher. And no, people no, believed no, 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 no. him. Rabbi certified. Maybe they're at no, my, my father in law's father was a butcher. Yeah. Synagogue, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so listen, I think we're, um, the point is, it's, it's, always, it's always something that everybody gets an opinion on at the Shabbos table. All right, let's go on the next verse. Yeah. Well, uh, chapter 19, verse 15, we've done only one verse today. Sorry, we've done, 
No, but we did that verse in depth. You can't have one witness to for a person for any sin or or chatas for any sin that he sinned. He has to be adjudicated on two witnesses or three witnesses. The matter should be rested. You can't convict somebody. Can't convict somebody on the base of one witness. You convict them on the base of two or three witnesses. Well, this is to be a formal conviction. The Talmud does speak of the fact that if you if the court thinks the guy is egregious, they know how to punish him extrajudicially. But the point is, it's a tough standard because just finding one witness sometimes is very right. Difficult. So exactly. So the point is the person they're trying to put to death is a person who's so egregious, the type of sinner that he's willing to commit the murder in front of two witnesses. If the person is only willing to do the act in front of one witness, they'll punish him another way, but they're not going to give him the death penalty. They're really looking for a person who's a certain type of willful, uh, brazen, uh, audacious sinner. Uh, a liar. No, no, no. Well, well, are we talking about adultery? We well, no, about... I'm saying what kind of person you need two witnesses to fit for a divorce for an adulterer, don't you? For mm -hmm. adult, well, well, there's two separate things. For a divorce, you need to mean for the divorce process. Yeah. There you need, well, that's, we rule today you need two witnesses. It's possible that biblically speaking, you maybe wouldn't need two witnesses for that. But here we're talking about a person who committed a sin. So, so I was referring to the, like the paradigm of like a murder or like somebody who did like that type of action, but adultery is especially hard at the time of debates. How you can have witnesses sure, for that, any right? Any sin, I'm just saying, but yeah, but divorce is a different type, divorce is a legal proceeding, so it's, a, it's yeah, not yeah. necessarily included within this. But you know, uh, the Talmud does discuss the case of a divorce with one witness, divorce with a scribe. Um, so the Talmud does discuss it. Uh, we just finished it, 89 pages of Tract Ekitin. Yeah, so Steve, I cut you off. So the Talmud says, This tells us that every time it says witness in the Torah, it refers to two, unless the Torah specifically says one. There is a classic case of one witness where one witness is believed. Where do we believe one witness? We believe one witness classically in cases of Easter Veheter to say something is kosher or not. We believe the person. We believe a woman says, you come into my house, I'll give you a meal, and I'm serving you kosher food. Well, how do we know to believe her? How do we know she's not serving pork? So we say that one witness is believed. Also, classically, even though- Even though Rashi doesn't connect them, it's exactly what you just talked about, about the previous verse, that one witness is, is enough. Right, and, and then the other case is we just we had this on the Talmud recently that if one witness comes from overseas and says that this man has died, we believe him. We believe that one witness, and the reason is because the uh, the consequences of being wrong are so great that we believe that the wife who wants to remarry won't remarry unless she checks it, unless she checks it. <coughs> okay. She says, For his friend to be punished for his testimony. So one witness, Rashi tells us, you can't punish him physically or monetarily, but a, a witness can force you to have to take an oath. And he can force you basically to, to swear in the court that, like if somebody says a claim that I saw you borrow $100 on this person, the person who he makes the claim against doesn't have to pay back, but he has to take an oath. Now taking an oath then is not like taking an oath today. Today, taking an oath, most people wouldn't want to do it, but they wouldn't view it as like such a terrible thing. I The way I think about it in my mind is, like having discovery rule that you have to be open to discovery in a trial. 
And people want to avoid that at all costs. So this is like an oath. People want to avoid an oath at all costs because you take an oath, you have to go into with a Torah scroll, often into a cemetery in the middle of the night. They say, if you swear falsely by God's name, you're going straight to hell. We're going to give you slashes. I mean, people really were, were terribly frightened about taking an oath. So that's the concept here. One oath could force you to do that. And Rashi gives the example. Amr al-Khaveri says to his friend, give me the money that I lent you. Amr al he says, actually, I have nothing. One witness testifies, she has to pay him. Okay. Al Okay. So Rashi says this teaches us that the testimony has to be oral. You can't have written testimony. They can't send it to the court. And also they can't have an interpreter. It has to be oral testimony before the judges. So if it says two witnesses, why does it say three witnesses? If you could do it on the basis of two, and why do you need three? Rashi does not address that here. But we know this from the Talmud, that the Talmud tells us is to teach us that two is equivalent of three. If one party brings forth three witnesses and the other party brings forth two witnesses to his case, you might have thought, okay, we'll believe the one who has three witnesses over the one who has two witnesses. We say, no, no, no. We, we view each one, we view two versus three as the same as two versus two and two versus a hundred as the same as, as two versus two. So even if one person brings a hundred witnesses, the Torah has advanced this idea, this powerful notion of uh, in the base of two witnesses. So but now we have the case of, of what is called Edim Zomami. This is a big, big, big Kiddush that the Torah creates. So let me just give you an introduction to this idea. If let's say Ruvain and Shimon are the witnesses and they testify that Levi is murdered, and then they testify that Levi murdered somebody. And then, uh, Don and Naftali come out forward and they say, no, Levi didn't kill this person. Now uh, they say, hey, maybe we saw somebody else kill, or maybe we saw Levi was with us then, where is alibi. So the two witnesses are contradicting each other. That's called Ede Achosha, contradictory witnesses. And then the matter is left unresolved. The matter is left unresolved. It's, it's their country. We, we don't believe it either two over the other two. But let's say, Ruben and Shimon say that Levi killed this person on Monday at five o'clock in, in New York. And then two other witnesses, Dan and Naftali say, we're not going to testify at all about whether or not Levy killed that person. Levy could have killed that person, but we know you could not have been in New York at five o'clock on Monday to see that because you were with us at five o'clock in San Francisco. We're not testifying about the facts in the case, we're just testifying about you. We're testifying Imanu Ayisem, the Makomponi, that you were with us in a different place. Well, if that's the case, that's what's called Edim Zomim. And, and the Torah says, in this case, we believe the latter two witnesses over the former two witnesses, and we do to the first two witnesses exactly like they plotted to do. Kasher Zamam Asosa Achif. So if they try to get Levi killed, then they are the ones who get killed. And this is what's called a Chiddush, because why should we believe the last two over the former two? But this is what the Torah is introducing us. And a question? Okay. So that's what the verse is going to sell us now. Let's say a false witness stands against the man to testify to something falsely. She says, The word sar means a thing that does not exist. This witness is removed. This is what I just said. You were with us that day in a different place. Meaning to say they're not testifying about the facts, but they're testifying about the witnesses. Says the verse, and two people who have the fight stand up before God. 
then two men stand up before the Kohanim and the judges. Rashi says, The verse speaks of well witnesses. It's telling us that in these types of cases, you cannot have women test witnesses. And they need to testify standing up. So the two men uh, who have the dispute, the litigants, stand before Hashem, before the courts. When you stand before a judge, you have to imagine as though you're standing before God. As it says, When you stand before a judge, you have to view yourself as standing before God. The judge is the, the hallmark of any independence, of any free democracy is an independent judiciary. And you have to respect the judicial judges. And that's a fundamental concept. Yeah, it's an independent judiciary. That's what I said. Well, we had this earlier in the Torah portion in this Parsha Shoftim. It says that you pick the judges and, and, and it says, you go to the judge will be in the, your time and you have to listen to them. It's an obligation to listen to the judges. And then it says that there will be a king and the king also has to obey the judges because it says the king has to walk around with the law, the law of the Torah. But the person who told me that was the chief rabbi of Venezuela when I went to Rabbi Pilgrim Brenner. When I went to Venezuela around 12 or 13 years ago and the country was falling apart. And, the, and, and he said, the problem with Venezuela, this was even before all the, the Venezuela really went down the tubes. He said, the judicial system is no longer independent. So who chose the judges? That's an excellent question. I believe that the judges were chosen as follows, that the, uh, we, we showed how the first Sanhedrin was chosen in the Torah, that there was prophecy, but then afterwards the judges would sit and then the students would be lined up in front of them. And when uh, one of the judges went, they took the top student and put him in. So the judges basically chose the judges. Like they do in Israel, which is... I don't know that they do it like they do in Israel. I'm just saying that they just... Well, I don't know how they do it in Israel, but and I'm not even 100% sure that this is how they did it then, but I think based, my understanding is on the way it's described in the Talmud, that the judges are the ones who chose the judges. But the other point would be uh, that only works if you have right. that only works if you have an independent judiciary. Mm -hmm. And if the judges choose themselves or choose each other, Sorry. it's not independent. So how should the judges be chosen? Well, I don't know if you can read the Israeli Reform Act if you want to. But there are lots of ways to do we, for example, put people on the Supreme Court, the president nominates, the Senate interviews them and confirms them, yeah. and then they go to the I, I certainly was not intending to opine on current politics. No, 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 I was I'm saying, saying yeah. the way this works, and the judges have so much power that it makes you ask the question, who makes the judges? I'm just right. saying, I'm even asking in this time, forget about the yeah. I, I So I'm not 100% sure that there was a discussion of how they were chosen, but I think they were chosen in the way I said, but I, I again, was just thinking that, but we could look into it more carefully, more closely. Jerry has a question. Jerry had a question. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, Mahavdil, is the Torah like the uh, uh, Taliban? Uh, they don't allow women to do anything. How come women cannot be uh, uh, witnesses in Judaism? That's a good point. That's a good question. How come the women are not able to be witnesses? And this is, uh, it's, it's, what the verse says, you're right. The Torah certainly, in the times of the Torah, was not egalitarian. Rabbi, not egalitarian. can I answer that based on actual modern TV? I, I, by all means, Rabbi Yosef. The answer I always, uh, we have to end, but the answer I always give is that uh, there's a show called House of Pain of Heller Perry, and there's this woman that um, is going to basically take care of kids of another woman the other woman was deemed by the court uh, unstable, and now she's claiming for custody. And so the lawyer, her lawyer, comes to their house to prepare her for the for the court, and he makes her cry. And she says, "Why are you doing this to me?" And she says, "And he says because this is what the defense lawyer of the other woman is going to do to you tomorrow." And basically, we respect women so much that we don't want them to have to be cross-examined and, and, and be subject to such scrutiny. Uh, like we call it modern, but it's really not modern. Uh, the, 
Maimonides yeah, actually yeah. says I, that I a woman like... has one witness, she doesn't have to go to, even for murder, she doesn't have to go to court because because right. we don't want her to be embarrassed like that. Shoshana well, does not approve. Shoshana does not approve because that seems a little bit apologetics. The bottom line is it's a verse. I mean, your answer we can discuss more tomorrow, but it's a bit some there are verses in the Torah, there are certain laws. And and practically speaking, practically speaking, um, I think actually most rabbinic courts today will accept women as witnesses as it relates to monetary matters, etc. So uh, I, the answer is we need to discuss more and we need a damage. We have some.